The 1960s boasted a relatively small number of female historians, mostly teaching in women's colleges. A small number of young women could be found in graduate schools of history, but their numbers never exceeded 10%. Still, among these women, questions of the women's movement resonated. Many of us, and I count myself among them, I was in graduate school from 1962 to 1968, had experienced the discrimination of graduate school itself. Some of us had already faced professional barriers. If we wanted to be taken seriously, we knew we would have to write the history of politics, of religion, of economics, of leaders, and of men. Unless we did this, we would never make it as historians. So we wrote our dissertations and generally our first books without women in them. I can't say that I thought twice about this. It seemed merely natural that we women would choose the kinds of topics that our male colleagues chose. The women's movement, especially as it reached new heights in 1968, 69, and 70, gave us pause. Had women acted collectively in the past, we asked? Where and how had they had access to power? What could we learn from earlier movements for equality? Its questions were our questions, and we, we historians, were uniquely qualified to answer them. Together, we turned our attention first to professional exclusion and then to the deeper causes of that exclusion. We had some help here as we rediscovered the work of preceding generations, work that had been lost to us, the writings of historians like Mary Beard and Eleanor Flexner came into our hands and then Anne Scott, who had begun to write about Southern ladies in the earlier 1960s. And there was Gerda Lerner. Gerda Lerner, activist, organizer, a woman who had come out of the community, a mother with two children, a PhD from Columbia that she had earned in 1967. To earn that PhD, she had written a biography of the Grimke sisters, that nobody at Columbia cared a whit about. She used to say that they had allowed her to do it because, after all, she was just a woman. The biography became, if not a best-selling book, a popular textbook widely used in high schools as well as university classrooms throughout the United States. Together with Gerda Lerner and others, we, we younger historians, engaged our own politics. To access the profession, we formed an organization that we labeled the Coordinating Committee of Women in the Historical Profession, the CCWHP. Our goal in the CCWHP was to change the profession to include more women as officers in professional societies to encourage more women to present papers at conferences, to place women on journal editorial boards and in committees. We started our own journals when the establishment journals wouldn't take our pieces. We organized our own conferences when we didn't get enough papers accepted to the national conferences. We pushed for recognition of women as professionals. And crucially, we thought and wrote about styles of learning and teaching in community and in collaboration. These styles were infused with feminist, non-hierarchical principles. We intended to infuse our pedagogy with a belief in human equality, and we ensured that in our teaching styles, we would include all who wanted to participate. All meant women, of course, as well as a few men, but it also meant people of color, older people returning to the university, workers who had not earlier had a chance to have an education. We were historians. 
We'd begun to understand something of the cultural injunctions that had constrained our own work. We developed a healthy skepticism about women's natural roles coming out of our own experiences in graduate school. And we knew by the 1970s that we had to use our training to expand our knowledge of our own past and to bring that knowledge to public attention. That was the birth of the history of women.